So the most copied shot in the history of tennis has to be Roger Federer's forehand. And I get so many emails sent to me with videos of players who have tried really hard to copy Federer's forehand, but unfortunately, it never really looks like Federer. And it's not only that the Federer forehand is difficult to copy at the recreational level, even at the elite level, you rarely see a player with Federer's forehand style. The closest one that comes to mind is Grigor Dimitrov, but other than that, I'm not aware of any player who has the Federer forehand. And the reason is that the Federer forehand has some really unusual characteristics that are very difficult to recreate unless they come intuitively to a player and look guys i understand that you're trying to copy federer's forehand it's one of the best forehands of all time and it's absolutely beautiful to look at it has so much style in the way he hits it so of course people want to copy it but interestingly i've been able to observe several technical flaws that players have developed when they try to copy federer's forehand so let's get started with some of these technical problems that you can get if you try to copy what federer is doing and it starts off in the preparation stage so when federer takes his racket back he will have his non-dominant hand go to about the back shoulder so the dominant shoulder will be aligned with the non-dominant hand and a lot of recreational players will not be able to come out of a turn that's this large players will copy this particular style their hand will go back here and now because there's such a large turn they're unable to come out of this turn quickly enough and they will make contact late with the dominant shoulder behind so if you find yourself making contact late that might be because of this better style turn so the easy fix is not to allow the non-dominant hand to go past the middle of your body so if this is the middle of your body when you're turning do not allow the non-dominant hand to go past this point you're going to stop right here and now the timing is going to be much easier and you'll be able to make contact with the dominant shoulder in front and let's get to the biggest problem players face when they try to copy Federer's forehand that is the racket drop and here's where a lot of problems start at the recreational level so first of all let's talk about Federer's racket drop so he has an eastern grip and what he does is highly unusual he will drop the racket with his strings being flat to the ground most players who have an eastern grip will not do that they will have the racket go back in a more neutral position so what Federer does is highly unusual he closes the racket and fully extends his arm and now because his racket is on the hitting side of the body he will have a very pronounced wrist lag only because the racket is going from this side to this side and you got to remember that at the high level the acceleration of the forehand is so fast that the wrist will actually lag like this the racket will go behind the hand a little bit that's how much acceleration is there and that's exactly what happens on Federer's forehand he closes the racket here and now as he accelerates the racket flips back this way and Roger's wrist lag is not different from any other high level player so let's compare someone else with an Eastern grip Juan Martin Del Potro so he will have him over neutral position of the racket head but when he accelerates his racket will go back into the same position that Roger achieves and here's the problem that I've been observing at the recreational level when players try to copy the Federer racket drop they will not be able to get enough acceleration in the stroke because this type of take back doesn't come natural to them so the racket will never go into this position they will drop the racket to the outside like Roger does and the racket gets to about right here once the stroke accelerates forward. So if this is you, if you're dropping the racket like Roger and the racket is lagging only to about right here, you're getting less range of motion than if you had more of a conventional tape pack, a la Vavrinka or Djokovic, where the racket will go further back and then naturally drop into this position. And now you're dealing with a lot more room for acceleration. If you're dropping the racket like Federer, and it doesn't come natural to you and the racket only goes to about right here there's not enough room for the racket to accelerate now this of course works beautifully for players who have a naturally shorter take back so for players who drop the racket here like roger does you will find that they accelerate fast enough that the racket will whip back in the proper position so my recommendation is that you don't try to copy this particular portion of Federer's forehand because while this comes natural to him and he's always done it so do what feels natural to you do not even think about how the rack is dropping let this part of the forehand occur naturally and what I have found with my students is that if they allow the racket to go back naturally this type of backswing will usually fit their genetics and the racket will have enough room to accelerate and the wrist lag will be sufficient so the next problem recreational players face who try to copy Roger Federer's forehand is the keeping of the head down at the moment of contact so if you watch Federer's forehand in slow motion you will see that he drops the racket and then as he's making contact he will keep his head down towards his strings and the vast majority of other elite players does not do this particular thing why because we actually cannot see the ball touch the strings at the moment of contact and not even Roger can see the ball so what most players do is they will have their head 
facing forward right at the moment of contact and some actually have their eyes closed. If you ever take a look at Dominic Thiem's forehand, when he is making contact, his eyes are actually closed. And I'm not advocating that you don't watch the ball. Watching the ball is one of the most important things that you need as a tennis player. But you're going to watch the ball for a very long time until you strike it and the actual strike occurs so fast that you can't see the ball. So the question is, should we keep the head down or should we keep the head up and not worry about it when we make contact? Well, I think if you do it naturally, your head will not be down at the moment of contact. And the reason why the vast majority of high-level tennis players do not keep their head down at the moment of contact has to do with torso rotation and the sequencing of it. So on a high-level forehand, the non-dominant side will lead the rotation. So the rotation will start when the racket starts to drop. And now when we hit the forward phase of the swing, meaning where the butt cap of the racket is pointing forward, our chest is already going to be open. And now if you think about it, keeping the head down here will be counterintuitive to this rotation. And even more so if we did this into the contact here. This will inhibit the rotation somewhat. And what I've observed at the rec level is players will exaggerate this movement and they will keep the head down way too long and because of that they're inhibiting their torso rotation. So it's absolutely unnecessary to keep your head down at the moment of contact because you can't see the ball anyway and this might inhibit your torso rotation. Now if you've done this naturally and never thought about it just like Roger then it might be okay to continue doing this but if you're forcefully keeping your head down just to be able to see the ball and some players try to even see the ball through the strings as they make contact and this is definitely something that will inhibit your stroke okay the next problem you're going to face if you try to copy roger federer's forehand is your interpretation of federer's relaxation so if you ever watch federer practice you're going to see him be very loose and relaxed and he's almost like he's not trying and some players love the way that looks and they try to copy so they come to me on the court and they're hitting the forehand like this with no intensity they're on their heels they're barely moving their feet the arm is super loose and the stroke is overall very sloppy what you have to remember is that what you're seeing from Federer online is not Federer's practice yes there's some videos of Federer's real practice but you're seeing his warm-up sessions in the tournament where he's not really trying a lot of players are like this they're not trying to get injured they just want to get a hit in and they're not really trying that hard they're not playing at a full intensity but when you see Federer playing a match or when you see him practicing for real you're going to see something completely different there's going to be a crazy amount of footwork there's going to be high intensity and his whole body is going to be under electricity so what I see from a lot of players is they unfortunately are copying the Federer that's warming up before his match and they come to the court and they're on their heels they're not moving their feet the arm is super loose it's like a spaghetti arm and they're not getting any control in fact they're framing a lot of balls because of that so Federer of course is one of the best footworks the best preparations and the best intensity of all time and this is exactly what you should be copying move your feet pretend like your whole body is under electricity and your forehand is going to improve because of that also do not allow your arm to be too loose as you're executing the forehand even Federer if you watch closely especially if you take still images of his forehand you will see that there's a lot of muscle flexion as he goes through his shot so even Federer is applying a lot of stability to his forehand and he's not as loose as you think he is all right on to the next Federer forehand problem at the recreational level that is the extension of the arm and there's a lot of confusion around this subject so players who have a bent arm there's absolutely no reason why you should try to straighten it because what will happen you will most likely going to try to straighten the arm and now because this doesn't come natural to you you're going to straighten the arm past the contact point you're most likely going to end up hitting through the ball this is what I see from a lot of rec players they'll straighten the arm down here and now they're consciously try to straighten the arm through the contact and the arm will go forward like this and then well after the ball has left the racket they bring the arm back in so what happens to a forehand like this most of the time is this particular part of the forehand happens in isolation so players are so concentrating on this particular part of the forehand that they stop moving the rest of their body they interrupt their rotation and they're basically straightening the arm through the ball while nothing else is happening and now you're stuck with a stroke that's heavily arm dependent so what happens on Federer's forehand yes he has extension of the arm through the entirety of the stroke so it will straighten the arm onto the racket drop but now the rotation will lead the way and never stops. so as he goes through his stroke the rotation will continue and the racket will end up moving in a circular fashion and guys I totally respect the fact that you're trying to learn the Federer forehand I love when players try to improve their game and this actually might have been helpful to your forehand in some degree but the reason why so many people request video analysis that have modeled their forehand after Federer 
is because they're having problems with their forehand. There's something wrong, they just can't quite get it right. And this is the reason why I made this video. I'm trying to help you so that you understand that some of the things that are happening on Federer's forehand are coming natural to Roger, but are gonna come unnatural to the vast majority of other players. So the fundamentals of the modern forehand are ubiquitous at the high level. And those are the loop, the sequencing of the torso rotation, and the contact that is made with the dominant shoulder in front. So you take any high level player and you will see those three technical characteristics. However, when it comes to the other things that are taking place on the forehand, those are stylistic preferences of each individual player that usually matches their genetic predisposition. And this is exactly why you see so many different grips, you see many different take backs, and you also see many different finishes. So you have to develop the fundamentals of the modern forehand and let those stylistic characteristics develop intuitively. And when you do that, something beautiful will happen. You will develop your own style that nobody else has and your forehand will be truly unique.